Okay, we're yeah. starting. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, we were talking about um, half intervals last time, and I said I'm going to start uh, to talk about them in terms of states, and I'm going to do that. But I think I ought to uh, finish the argument that I was sort of in the middle of, and um, then we can uh, continue. First, are there any questions? Because this stuff is pretty, it, it's fairly high level stuff. And um, uh, so it's, it's important that you ask questions, um, partly so that you understand the answer to your question but also um, so that um, I can understand better what to, what to say when I'm teaching. Okay. I've put some new notes on the web, class webpage, and I'll try to think up some uh, sensible homework problems um, in the next uh, day or so. Well, tonight's the big debate, so I'm not going to be doing anything useful. Um, between uh, seven and eight thirty. All right. So let's um, see. I've, we we've been writing the electromagnetic field, we write it classically, then it's um, a sum, lambda equal plus minus integral epsilon lambda of k, and here we can have a lambda of k. This is actually quantized. And the normalization conventionally is square root of 2 pi cubed, 2, 2 omega. This is if kx is k dot x minus uh, omega t. And um, these epsilons, Epsilon lambda of k, as I said, was um, actually epsilon plus minus of k is 1 over root 2, a rotation matrix that takes you to um, k hat, I guess is what I should have said, rather than k, 1 um, plus or minus i, 0. And if we want to think of, so I'm thinking of this as a vector since we set, we set um, a zero uh, equal to an integral of the um, charge density. This is a three by three rotation matrix. In fact, I think what I'm going to say um, as one homework problem, show the delta A is zero. Um, anyway, so that's the general context. And um, as I said, you can either think that um, that we start with the Newtonian. Let's see. Are we going to have? Is this going to be uh, another? <laughs> oh, my God. All right, all right. Let's, let's, let's try not to get sick. Okay. Can you roll up the window maybe to here and open a couple of um, the lower ones? But be careful of your laptop. Um, Can I ask you a question real quick? Not only that, but you get a chalk awesome. Uh Can you 
give like a little explanation of where this equation comes from again? You mean this? That this top one? Yeah. Field? Okay. Um, well, effectively, all we're doing is we're saying that uh, we want to express a transverse field, mm -hmm. a transverse three vector field. All right? Now, so we have uh, some vectors, three vectors, that, as I said, are transverse, and that'll be one homework problem. Then um, we expect that this field, actually, I've gone to, in a sense, I'm, 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 I'm gone, in a sense, to the interaction picture in which this has free field time, de free field time dependence. Um, and so you see that this thing, this equation satisfies box A equals zero, which is what we expect for the, the um, electromagnetic uh, potential, especially in the Coulomb gauge. Um, so that explains these guys. We're integrating over everybody so that we have uh, the most general field. This is basically just normalization. And um, in fact, I have a discussion of this in the chapter on Fourier integrals in my book. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and then these are annihilation and creation operators for a photon. And um, for example, a photon of momentum k and polarization lambda is just a dagger of lambda over k on the vacuum state. Okay, so this is. So is there any more like derivation from it, or is it just kind of you? This is we write down a form that we want to solve these things. Well. Uh, you're quite right to ask all these questions. They're good questions. In fact, I think I owe you more than talk. Um, um, the deal is that you see, we started out talking about path integrals, and then when we got to this uh, on, on Monday, we got to path integrals of quantum, quantum electrodynamics. So that is is um, kind of a, uh, a sophisticated application of path integrals. And I thought, gee, I better show you how we can um, think about these transverse fields. And it turns out that the transverse fields are easier to think about if you go to this operator language. Also, we had to. I mean, if we, if we de imagine deriving the path integral for quantum, from electrodynamics, then um, we would start with the, the quantized Hamiltonian and proceed. So we would have this as the field. Now, um, what you can show, and I was thinking of assigning this as a homework problem, but I, I want to hesitate because it might be a little bit hard. But what you can show is that if you have these, um, if this is the field, and if these uh, annihilation and creation operators obey the commutation relation um, delta lambda lambda prime delta q of k minus k prime, in fact, let me make sure that I'm Right, and I don't need the transverse delta function here. These transverse, yeah, this is fine. In fact. Right, and of course the annihilation operators commute themselves, the creation operators commute themselves, and that commutation is basically that these are Bose particles, and they're Bose because it's spin one. Yes. Sorry, on the creation and annihilation operators, I don't. I don't say it again. Thank you. I don't seem to recall. Let's see. I don't seem to recall uh, seeing a creation annihilation operator 
function which is based on k, really. How does, in what way is There's the, a k there. Yes, I know, but what, I mean, what is the creation annihilation operator equal to such that it's the function of k? And what does its function of k do other than give you this other function? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, what it does is it, it the, the physically, the creation operator maps the vacuum into a state of one photon. Right. And then the annihilation operator, on the other hand, maps A of, say, K and lambda on a state K prime lambda prime, well, what would we expect this would do? This subtracts one photon. Okay. So we'd say, well, this is going to give us back the vacuum if k is k prime and lambda is lambda prime. On the other hand, it's going to give us zero otherwise. Because it would be taking a, 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 a photon from the back. It would take a k lambda photon from a state that doesn't have one. So that would be zero. Yeah, there's a question back there. So if, if k prime and lambda prime are larger than k and lambda. Did you say larger? Yeah. It's whether they're the same or different. So if they're different, then they, that would be zero? k is a three vector. Right. And lambda is plus or minus. So, if they so what is this? This thing is delta lambda lambda prime <coughs> vacuum. Where is it? And the reason for that is that this is equal to A of K lambda, a dagger of, well, I was writing K lambda, I've changed notation, lambda, lambda prime, K prime, vacuum, okay? And then this is equal to uh, a dagger of lambda prime, K prime, A <coughs> K, um, I want to get the sign right. I think it's minus. Well, no, it's probably plus. Okay. So. And um, A on that is zero. And so this is simply delta lambda lambda prime delta q k minus k prime vacuum. So let me see if I understand this right now. If you add um, the creation operator onto the vacuum, it basically summons up a photon with polarization of I'm sorry, say that again. If you add the creation operator, creation add operator. Add the creation operator? Act or uh, add. operates. Sorry, uh, operator, creation operator. Or just the stage act. Sorry, you act, act on, on what? On the vacuum state. On yes. The creation operator as a function of lambda and k. That will call to existence. That will, make the sta that will make a state of one photon of type lambda k. Right, so that would be polarization lambda. Yeah. And weight number k, yeah. essentially. And then uh, hitting a pre existing photon with um, polarization lambda, I think. And wave number k with an annihilation operator as function of lambda and k would then destroy that photon. Yeah, if, you, if, the, the, if, if the variables match. Okay, I understand. All right, and um, these things are like harmonic oscillator variables. You know, when you study the harmonic oscillator, you have annihilation creation operators, but there, what you say, since you have one mode, is you say a dagger. One. Was there a question? So if they don't match up, sorry going back, they don't match up, then you get, you, you, there's, there's nothing. Right. He said it's not the vacuum state. So if say lambda doesn't equal lambda prime, then that's just zero. It's not the vacuum right, state. Right, right, right. So what does that mean? Right. You yeah. just get zero. So what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so basically you're, sorry. It's gone. Poof. <laughs> but that's that is that's different to the harmonic oscillator. If you apply the annihilation operator, yeah, 
to like this. On the ground state that's zero. Yeah, on the ground state, but on something that's not the ground state. The Vacuum's the ground state. I think. Uh, Lord, Lord, let, let's look at it again. <laughs> A on this state is one. But that's not the ground state. All right. A on this A on this state is A on a dagger ground state. Yeah. But we have this commutation relation. A a dagger minus a dagger a is delta. So a a dagger is a dagger a plus delta. All on the ground state, the vacuum. And a annihilates the vacuum. So that's zero. And so we just have delta zero. And this global warming is continuing here. Well, I don't know. Let me be done about it. Thanks. Um, so we, we square with this now? But um, do ask a question because all of these things are. You have another one? Just to clarify whether it's how analogous it is to the harmonic oscillator. Um, it's very analogous, and it would be even more analogous, analogous if we go to a um, discrete set of modes. And this is um, the, the phrase in the jargon. In the jargon is. We put the universe in a box and we impose periodic boundary conditions. Then what we have is A lambda K, A dagger lambda prime K prime is delta K, K prime, delta lambda lambda prime, where these are chronic deltas. And these um, Ks are um, I think the phrase is 2 pi over um, L, N1, N2, N3. L being the size of the universe. So you have um, the speed of light times 15 billion years or 30 billion years. Okay. And now this thing would be a sum over K and L, and the com and, and and so then what you have is you have a harmonic oscillator or for each mode, each lambda and each K, K being discrete, each K associated with a triplet of integers. Okay, so you have a harmonic oscillator for each triple of integers and uh, and each value of a lambda for plus or minus. And, and so this is, this is a perfectly legitimate way of thinking about it. And um, in fact, if you want to uh, uh, get the Casimir effect right, then you need to, um, it's good to sort of put the universe in a box, and then you look at your two plates. Okay, so. Are there more questions or? With the harmonic oscillator, if you successively apply the creation operator, do you not get excited states? Is that why I just Right. We, 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 uh, successively applying a dagger, you go from 0 to 1, then to 2, then to 3, and so forth with funny square roots. Yeah. In this case, the here, here, what you do if you add, um, it, it's clearer in this case, if you um, put in lots of photons of a particular mode, you would have n photons of that value of k and that value of lambda. And you'd have something like a dagger lambda k to the n would be a state of n <coughs> photons of um, type k and lambda might write it this way. And then, um, what is this? This is what, square root of n factorial or square root of n plus 1 factorial? Yes. Is 
10 plus 1. He's a creation operator operating on 0. And yeah, 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 yeah. I think it is 10 plus 1. So in this case, for this, I guess, generalization of the creation validation operators, the photon would be sort of considered the excited state of the vacuum. You could think of it that way, yeah. But so it's some limited extent. I think he deserves one too. Oh, yeah, oh, that's right. You don't want another look? Maybe that's good. I'll do Alright, could you try to ask a question? Alright, I got a question for you. <laughs> so this, uh, this this field, what are the eigenstates of it? Like, what are the eigenstates of this field? Is it the Fox states, like integer okay. number of photons, or is it coherent light, or what's the... Alright, okay. Um, good question. This is a Hermitian operator, so there are eigenstates. The eigenstates are, in fact, the ones that we were using to make the path integral. There are eigenstates of this with eigenvalue and these are transverse and that's how we make the path so that was a very good question so you're not hungry enough to ask a question yeah, I had some chocolate before class. What? I had some chocolate before class for a while. Oh, okay. <laughs> By the way, I if 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 I could figure out some way of bringing in pieces of something healthier, I would. I I don't know. This is America, and it's very hard to buy anything except sugar. <laughs> you eat carrots. Huh? Carrots. You just throw carrots at us. <laughs> With things and broccoli. All right, I'll think about that. <laughs> um, the one one thing about about this sugar and high fructose corn syrup, of course, is that it's very cheap because of all sorts of government agricultural programs. And secondly, um, the stuff doesn't support life. So um, you can have a candy bar on a shelf. And it doesn't, it doesn't go bad. It doesn't rot because the bacteria can't live on it. And, um, um, and in fact, that's why Coke is the way it is. It's not only loaded with sugar, but it's also carbonated. Carbonation produces an acidic, um, certain acidic bubbles, so it's unlikely to kill people directly, indirectly. Diabetes and obesity and other things, yes, it kills people. In fact, um, the only way to contain health costs, in, in, in my view, is preventing medicine. Doing something like Mayo Bloomberg did in New York, which was to ban sugary drinks in New York for more than 16 months or so. Okay. So, any other questions or shall I go on with this? All right, we had um, a Hamiltonian, and we worked out that the Hamiltonian, I think I'll put in the matter plot. It's an integral of a half i squared plus curl of a, this is the magnetic field, minus a dot j d cubed x, and then plus the Coulomb term, and the Coulomb term is um, a half integral j0 of x and j0 of y and d cubed uh, x, d cubed y over um, 4 pi x minus y. And last time I mumbled something about, well, this, 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 this is crazy from the point of view of relativity or just basic physics, but on the other hand, um, the theory is still relativistically invariant. What I should have said was that anything that's gauge invariant 
is relativistically invariant. So in other words, um, if you compute E, the electric field, or B, the magnetic field, uh, you find that they are not sensitive to changes in J0 uh, at remote locations. All right, well, um, if you look at this, this pi is the time derivative of A, and it's also transverse. And um, what we have is the Theta Bay uh, transverse commutation relations. And to let me just skip what you actually have. This I wrote down last time. O1 through ON, this time-ordered product is then integral O1 on e to the i s is Coulomb action delta of del dot a da d psi divided by the same thing da d psi and uh, okay so now what we want to do is we want to manipulate or take advantage of this path integral formulation. So to go from there to there, um, I'm sort of saying, trust me, uh, we saw that it worked in a fairly, I did it for you for the scalar field. Now we're just going to do it for the, um, for a non-scalar field. And in fact, um, when I did it for the scalar field, I actually did it for the ground state of the free field theory. And um, uh, so I'm sort of saying, trust me, it works in the general case. Um, although for practical purposes, the case where it's just the, just the, the vacuum state, <coughs> or the, the vacuum state of the free theory, um, is the most important case because the only thing we know anything about and calculate with and um, what people really do is perturbation theory. Although this this thing is this thing in the analogous expression in Euclidean space where you have an Euclidean time order and e to the minus an action, Euclidean action or e to the minus an energy density, that's the basis for uh, lattice gauge theory, and um, which is a, a way of doing these things uh, numerically, um, which is what you have to do if you um, if you uh, unless you have a free field theory. So this this S sub C is then an integral of a half a dot squared minus a half curl of a squared plus a dot j plus the matter of the Lagrange density of action of e force x minus integral bc d times. So this is terribly non-relativistic. It's very unsymmetrical and so forth. And um, this delta of del dot A, as you asked uh, in an earlier thing, is the product over space time of delta of del dot A of X. Okay, now um, what we do is we introduce a fudge factor F, which is an integral, it's actually a path integral, e to the i integral a half, and it turns out that the sign should be plus so we we bring a0 back into the theory we banned a0 because we said a0 is a dependent variable it's just dependent upon j0 and so there's no a0 in the path integral over there at all and now we bring it back in as a as just something we path integrate over with this funny factor. And we multiply then the numerator and the denominator here by f. 
So we put an F here and an F there. And now, um, what happens? Well, this F is then uh, E to the I integral. And I, I worked this out last time, so I'm just going to say what it is. It's gradient A0 minus A0 J0 minus a half J0 inverse Laplacian J0 d4 of x dA0. And inverse Laplacian is just a fancy way of saying 1 over, one over 4 pi integral, uh, 1 over 4 pi x minus y integrated over, if this is x and that's y, you integrate over d cubed x d cubed y. Okay, um, so this thing is actually e to the i integral a half rad a0 squared minus a0 j0 d fourth x plus i integral d coulomb dt dA0. Um, and the inverse Laplacian actually has a minus sign in it. That's why this minus sign went away. OK, so now <clears throat> let me come over here. This, this ratio of path integrals, just so as not to have to write it again, let me say what it is. It's now going to be, I'll, I'll just imagine the equal sign comes way over here. In fact, why don't I just go up here. So omega, time order product, all these operators. So it's now, integral O1 through ON, now e to the i s prime, still delta of the divergence of A, dA d psi over integral e to the i s prime, divergence, delta of divergence, dA d psi. But now s prime is starting to look a little bit more symmetrical. So it's these terms plus a dot j minus a zero j zero. And what's happened is that the Coulomb term has canceled. So the original s over here had a Coulomb term in it. And now we get the Coulomb term with a plus sign from f. And that uh, cancels it. So now S is all of this, this is a minus sign, uh, plus, all right, I think I'm going to have to erase this here. The matter Lagrangian d4 of x. So that's what S prime is. And it occurs here, and that's because it absorbed these terms from S. So now it's starting to look very nice. And in fact, what we can do, since we've got this, these delta transverse delta functions here, or these delta functions of del dot A, we can add in a term of the form uh, del dot A dot times A zero. And this is zero because A it has no divergence. And if we integrate by part, this is the same thing as minus A dot dotted into gradient of A zero. A zero being a mathematical variable that we introduced. But we have path integrating over it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm just missing something maybe with the mathematics. But can you explain like how you bring that F into this integral here? Right. 
Was that a question? Yeah, like so you just multiply the top and bottom by f. Right? Yes. And but that's over like an integral over a zero, and this is over an integral of a and psi. So, so this I just has a zero and j zero. Where is it? F is this a a zero squared a zero j zero. Yeah. And then this, in fact, it was originally this thing. So how do you like multiplying that by this integral? How do you combine this exponential term? Isn't that what you're doing here? Yeah, I'm just combining the two exponentials. So how? Do, I mean, that just doesn't sound like. So it's this allowed. is one exponential. I just added this one half to this term. But I mean, this is an integral over a different, like, I mean, if you have an integral over like the same variable times an integral over the same variable, you can't just put the integrals together, can you? Sure. You can? Yeah, because we're integrating over different things. The oh, original okay. so thing the, the original thing was integrating over three vector A and psi. Oh, okay, I see. So then I'm and adding here to B. psi is still in here. Yeah. But this is this new A zero and now right. we integrate over A zero. Okay, alright, that makes sense. Good. Alright, thank you. Great question. Thank you, sir. The second short that was such a good question. Thank you. All right. So now we've added this term, which is just zero because of the uh, delta function. Um, but when we add it. You see, we can combine it with the a0 squared term and the a dot term, and then we have this minus sign. So this thing now is simply s. s is then equal to a half a dot minus rad a0 squared minus a half curl of a squared plus a dot j minus a0 j0 plus ln t4 of x. So that's what s is. Now this thing is the, you know, this is the, lo the lovely Lorentz invariant, gauge invariant expression for the action because this s is just an integral of a half e squared minus b squared which is gauge invariant and Lorentz invariant, uh, plus a dot j minus a0 j0 plus lm, integrating, of course, t fourth x. So this is the uh, this thing is a Lorentz inner product of two four vectors, so it's Lorentz invariant, and then we assume that the action of the matter field is Lorentz invariant. And gauge invariant below. It's just to what's well, actually gauge invariant, just so I don't fit. It's this whole structure that's gauge invariant. This is Lorentz invariant, but it's not gauge invariant because of the A. But this plus that is gauge invariant and Lorentz invariant. So how that comes about is, uh, is, 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 uh, is related to that lecture I gave on, on gauge theory, which I couldn't help but generalize to the non opinion case. OK, so there we are. Everything then is hunky-dory. In fact, even a nicer way of writing this as is an integral minus a quarter FAB FAB minus ABJB uh, no plus ABJB. Wow, there's an error. Plus LM.
plus because we have this, it's, it's this term that governs the sum. Okay, so at this point we have that this time, this mean value of the time ordered product now, we get rid of the prime on S, and this is this nice gauge invariant quantity, and the only thing that's, the only fly in the ointment is this double function. Oh boy, I hope that hasn't been there too long. I don't know why. Gone. All right, so um, let's give the student, uh, any student, time to look at this here. All right, the next thing is to make a gauge transformation. And So the gauge transformation here then is a prime b of x is a b of x plus the b derivative of some lambda of x. And the matter field psi prime of x is going to be e to the i q lambda of x psi of x. I left out the q when I gauge the gauge the, when I went through gauge theory uh, last time simply because I wanted a, a nicer notation. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make this gauge transformation and we're going to replace the fields everywhere by their their gauge transforms. Um, and we're going to say, first of all, that these operators, we're going to restrict ourselves to operators such that be, they are gauge invariant. So we're only going to deal with, we're going to give up trying to form the, uh, trying to compute matrix elements of operators that are not gauge invariant. We're going to restrict ourselves to gauge invariant operators. Next, we're going to assume that this measure is gauge invariant, which it is, but I'm not going to go into that. This action I just got through telling you is gauge invariant. So we can replace, <coughs> we can put primes everywhere, and the only thing that changes is this. And so we, in fact, still have an expression but now, our expression is that this is equal to O1, ON, e to the i s, but now it's delta of del dot A plus Laplacian of lambda dA d psi divided by integral e to the i s delta of del dot A plus Laplacian lambda dA d psi. So we have it, we still got the same equation. This is the mean value of the time ordered product of these gauge invariant field operators. And now what we have is we have we have a choice. We can go, there's a fork in the road. And um, um, there's a joke associated with that, but I can't remember how it goes, so I'm going to skip it. Um, uh, so we, uh, I'll show you the two things we can do. The first thing is we can say, all right, we're going to integrate over all gauge functions in the numerator and the denominator. And um, What happens 
is that when we, we're, in other words, we're going to do d lambda here, d lambda there. Okay? And now when we do that, the delta function goes away. Um, and and um, so apart from overall constants, what we have is this goes away when we integrate over lambda. We're done integrating over lambda, and so now we've got a very nice expression. So we have the gauge invariant operators, e to the i, the gauge invariant, relativistically invariant action, the gauge invariant measure, and then the denominator, the same thing, e to the i, s, integrating over all the gauge fields. Notice we're not fixing the gauge at all in this case. And um, so what we have is a ratio of path integrals. In each case, the numerator and the denominator, we have effectively a factor of infinity because we're integrating over these extra gauge copies. So for every psi and A, for each psi and A, we're integrating over all the gauge transforms of them, and all those gauge transforms then uh, have the same S, and all of this is the same, so we get an infinite factor of the numerator, an infinite factor of the denominator, because we have a ratio we cancel. So this is a uh, correct expression. That's one way of going. The other, yeah. Sorry, why does the, why when you integrate the laminas, the delta function go away? Give me that again. You just integrated the top and bottom over lambda. Right. And that just got rid of the delta. That got rid of the delta. That's obvious, so I don't see that. Obviously. Right, good question. Um, so let's see, we go back to here. Everything's gauge invariant. We made the transformation and we have the plus lambda here. And now we can, so that's for one gauge transformation, but now we can integrate in numerator and denominator over lambda. And um, as we integrate over lambda, <coughs> what do we get? Well, for each A, that gives us, you know, the delta function, and we're integrating over lambda, we're getting zero, and then poof! The thing blows up and gives us, you know, a spike when the lambda is such that the Laplacian of lambda is minus the divergence of A. And um, the same thing happens in the denominator, but the situation is that, you know, the poof that it gives us cancel. In other words, we're we're integrating del dot A, delta of del dot A plus Laplacian lambda, D lambda. And then in the denominator, we have delta of del dot A plus Laplacian lambda, D lambda. So for each A in the numerator, this thing is going to give us a finite contribution. We don't compute what it is, but it cancels. That's the idea. Very good question. In fact, to tell you the honest truth, when I was going through that, I had forgotten the details of that argument. You forced it out of me. All right, so that's one way of doing it. The other possibility is, is um, the other fork, taking the other fork now, what we're going to do is, is get, do something that will allow us to do perturbation theory. 
Um, let's see, maybe we, before taking that talk, I should stop and tell a brief story. All right. One was the Three Mile Island disaster. I've been reading this autobiography of Richard Wilson, a Harvard professor who analyzed risk and especially nuclear power, but also carcinogens. And um, what happened at Three Mile Island was that the, for some reason, the pipes started banging. And the operators assumed that there was too much water, too much cooling water going through the reactor and it was making the pipes bang. Um, I, don't, I don't remember why they thought that. It may have been that the, um, the signal they were getting on, I think it was true that the signal they were getting on their um, gauges gave the impression that there was too much water in the reactor. And so they turned off the cooling. They turned off the cooling. And uh, in other words, the water flowed to the reactor and just the water to the reactor. That, of course, uh, was the worst possible thing to do. And um, it uh, caused a uh, meltdown. It was a small release of radioactivity, but it wasn't enough to hurt anybody. And I, I don't know how long they still shut the water off, but by the time uh, word had gotten out to people who really were experts, as opposed to the guys actually operating them, um, maybe an hour had gone by, and so the guys they were told then turn the water on and. Um, to shut down as, as best you can. And uh, so there was, there was no disaster. The real disaster was that the, um, the media, TV in, the, in Pennsylvania and uh, elsewhere, just went wild about the thing and spoke as if it had been a major nuclear disaster. This caused people living anywhere nearby to try to get out of town. And so, there, of course, there were immediate traffic jams, and then people were sitting there in their cars, scared to death because they were listening to the radio, all sorts of hysterical reports. One person had a heart attack and died because of this, uh, he was so frightened, uh, sitting there in his car in the traffic jam. And, um, Jimmy Carter was president at the time, and he had been trained as a nuclear engineer um, at Annapolis and uh, served in, on a nuclear submarine. So he understood nuclear power. He realized after calling people who knew what they were talking about that there was really no public health danger. So he flew with his wife to the uh, to Three Mile Island the next day and appeared in the control room uh, or in, anyway, near the control room and uh, tried to get the media to reassure the public that there was no public health danger. But apparently the media just didn't pay any attention to that, to his appearance, because that would ruin the drama of their story in which they were able to sell uh, Lots of newspapers and char they were able to have to charge more for their advertisements because they had commercials because they were they had more eyeballs watching and um, so that was the truth. And, and as I said the real disaster far from the heart attack and the, the fear that was engendered in many people was that. Um, essentially a freeze on the nuclear power industry in the United States. The result of that was that the coal industry uh, had a complete green light to build new coal fired power plants, mine more coal, and then the air pollution. Coal is what really kills people. It kills at least 10,000 Americans a year. In China, it's probably 60,000, 80,000. And uh, what 
goes up the flue is not only carbon dioxide, but particulate matter goes into the lungs and you can't get it out. Because you can get most of it out, but there are particles that are in the micron region that are too big for the cells to absorb them, too small for the cilia to move them out, so they just stay there, and that causes uh, emphysema and, in some cases, cancer. About 10,000 premature deaths because of the uh, particulate matter of the coal fired power plants in the United States. Um, there's also a lot of mercury that goes up the flue. And, uh, and of course, CO2, which in the air used to go to global warming. And, uh, what's going to happen to global warming, of course, is uncertain, but um, my suspicion is that it's going to be worse than the prediction predictions were made by a committee. Whenever you have a committee doing anything, you come out with a consensus while we run. It's not the smartest guy in the room who writes the report. It's the, it's the group acting in, in consensus mode. And so you get um, a consensus. And these scientists didn't, the thing they really wanted to avoid was being accused of false alarms. So I think that they're overly conservative. And then what we see happening is almost no government action except for some weak action in Europe. But even the European action is almost useless because due to Fukushima, which was again an, an act, a nuclear accident when nobody died, many of the Europeans are turning off their nuclear reactors and turning on the coal. And so we're going to have more gold along the way with less. Could be hundreds of millions of people perishing because of global warming. Because although I said, well, the rise of the sea level isn't that big a deal, you just go to high ground, and here in New Mexico we're a mile high, so who cares? <laughs> um, the fact is, people in Bangladesh don't have the money to move, and they're at uh, they're at an altitude of one meter, maybe on foot, and if they, they have to move maybe, I don't know, 100 miles or to get to an altitude of two meters. And so it's, a, it's, it's the poor who are going to suffer from, from this. Um, the U.S. will form a, either a political union with Canada or will just attack Canada and take over. Uh, Anyway, all right, end of story. Um, back to the physics and the other, um, the other road. The other road is to do, um, is to do something, uh, something different. So we're back at, um, we go back to the same state where we've made a gauge invariant, we've made the gauge transformation but we haven't yet integrated over the so we're at this stage okay now what we do is we multiply by another fudge factor this time it's e oh wait sorry are we just multiplying top and bottom by that right and it's e to the minus i over 2 alpha integral minus Laplacian of lambda squared d4 x. Okay, so we integrate, multiply top and bottom. And we have a particular lambda here. OK. And we're going to integrate d lambda. But there's a trick. Um, so, so far, we haven't changed anything because what we did, what we did change, what we did multiplying by this, integrating over lambda, it's the same thing it cancels. 
But now, before we integrate over all the gauge transformations, um, we're going to shift lambda so that the Laplacian of lambda decreases by a dot. And that means that these factors that we introduce, instead of being what they are, are now e to the minus i over 2 alpha integrated a dot 0 minus Laplacian lambda squared d fourth x. So, in other words, before integrating over lambda, we're going to shift lambda by a certain amount. And now, when we integrate over lambda, this delta function, which is still sitting here, uh, turns Laplacian of lambda into minus del dot a. And that means that this exponential has changed, and now it is e to the minus i over 2 alpha integrated a dot 0, but minus Laplacian lambda has turned into plus del dot a squared d fourth x. So now what we've got when we integrate over lambda is we have a new formula. And this new formula is that this thing is equal to an integral O1 through Om e to the i s sub alpha dA d sine divided by integral e to the i s alpha dA d sine. And what is, what is this? Well, this S alpha is equal to minus a quarter FAB, FAB minus AB, JB, or is it plus? I'm, I'm, I'm now, I want to get it right, so hold on a second. I think I changed minus to plus, yes. It's plus, and um, plus the matter Lagrangian, and then one other factor. And the other factor is minus alpha over 2 db <coughs> ab squared. And of course, d fourth x. Okay, you were about to say something. No, no, I figured out. All right, so in other words, um, this thing here is just, uh, once it's in this form, this is of the form dBAB. So this, if, if when B goes from 1 to 3, this is just del dot A. And when it's 0, it's just the time derivative of A0. This is Lorentz invariant. So what we've got is a Lorentz invariant term, but it's not gauge invariant. So we've broken gauge invariants, which allows us to do perturbation theory. Moreover, we, we're doing perturbation theory in which we've broken gauge invariants, but not broken Lorentz invariants. So we have nice Lorentz invariant perturbation theory. Um, but. Uh, But now, when we do da d psi, we have something that doesn't have this extra infinity in it, because there isn't any gauge invariance anymore. And the result is that we can, um, we can, in a sense, for practical purposes, forget about the ratio and just compute uh, the numerator perturbatively, and we don't get infinity as a big factor. So that's the idea. Yes. I think I made them wrong, but in order for del a dot zero plus, or in order for del b a b to be equal to the 
something that's equal to, shouldn't there be a negative sign there somewhere? No, no, there's no negative sign. Great question. Let's, let's, let's just see what this is explicitly. Know that this is just this. This is this is partial. In other words, x zero. Well, this is just the divergence of it. Right. X zero with an upper zero is time. Right. But shouldn't there be a one of them is a controversial. I don't remember what the terms were. Just one of the negative sign terms. This A with an upper B is contravariant. D with a lower B is covariant. Right. And the dot product of them is Lorentz invariant. Right. And it has this form. There's no minus at all. afternoon, so um, almost never in the morning, but um, in the afternoon, if anybody wants to combine. All right, so <clears throat> all right, so maybe I should quickly say, you, you remember that when we did the path integral for a scalar field, we were able to we put in a current, classical current, and then we did a shift, and then we got an expression for the time order mean value of the vacuum of the time order product of two fields, and it was basically fine and propagated. You can do the same thing here, and when you do that, what you get, and so I'm just going to give you the answer here. what you get is now the vacuum of the free field theory a a say of x a b of y what you get is minus i delta a b of x minus y and this is minus i integral eta a b that's lower a b over q squared minus i epsilon e to the i q x minus y e fourth q over two minus four um, I think I should derive that for you, but it's too late today to derive this. So, so far I've assigned only one homework problem, right? Showing that the thing is transverse, right? Mm -hmm. All right, let me start the, the coherent state stuff now. Um, and I put this already on the web page. So uh, how many of you have, have had coherent states in one of your classes, quantum mechanics or optics? What do you mean, just general coherent states? Coherent states. All right. Okay, so this will be a review for some of you, and it will be new for others. Now, the stuff that I've been doing today has been pretty much um, It's been, this is rather fancy physics and it may have,
been somewhat mysterious and hard to understand. Now I'm going to talk about things that I want you to really understand. Um, and uh, in other words, you should be able to understand this really. Um, the stuff that I did until now today and also on Monday was stuff that normally occurs in the second semester of a quantum field theory class because I've been sort of following uh, Z and trying to fill in things. Um, and because he started with pattern drills, I sort of felt that I had to bring in this very advanced stuff early in the course. So now let's back up and see things and see some simple things. First of all, what's a coherent state? Minus alpha squared over 2 e to the alpha a dagger on the vacuum. And that's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it, which I didn't write down in the notes, is to call, say that this is d of alpha 0, where d is unitary, and it's e to the alpha a dagger <coughs> minus alpha star a on the vacuum. So, so when I know you don't like hearing this, but what physically is coherent state? What do you mean by that? Well, let's, let's put it this way. Suppose we do put the universe in a box, or we quantize the modes inside the um, box of a laser, which has mirrors at both ends. Then um, we are dealing with discrete harmonic oscillators, and so in some approximate way, the coherent state for the mode of the laser is, in other words, the laser beam is actually a coherent, it's approximately a coherent state for that mode, particular polarization and wave number. So you can think of it that way. Otherwise, it's this creation operator. So he, here I'm just talking about one mode. So we can be just discussing the harmonic oscillator. If you want. So we have alpha is a complex number, a dagger on the vacuum. And what do we get? Well, this is e to the minus absolute value of alpha squared over 2. We expand this thing. It's alpha a dagger to the n over n factorial vacuum. And this is e to the minus alpha squared over 2 sum alpha to the n. And this turns out to be square root of n factorial, the state of n quanta, or the nth excited state of the harmonic oscillator. And in fact, the formula is n, let's see, a dagger to the n on 0 is equal to square root of n factorial. So I actually guessed correctly in that um, Times the state of n quanta. Now, and I may make this a homework problem, you can then show that this coherent state is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator with a complex eigenvalue alpha. So it's, and then you'd say, well, why a complex? Well, A is not Hermitian. So we have a complex uh, uh, eigenvalue. And moreover, if we take the adjoint of this equation, then it's alpha A dagger is alpha alpha, which is, of course, it's star same thing as alpha star alpha. All right. In fact, I'm, I think I'll assign as a homework problem. Given this definition, show uh, derive uh, this relation. So that'll be another homework problem. That would be trivial to coherent states in a, pre, in a previous course. 
Another thing is that these coherent states are complete and it's time to end. Let me show you what the um, identity operator is. It's an outer product of coherent states d2 alpha over pi, where d2 alpha is just d real alpha, d imaginary alpha. So you just integrate over the complex alpha plane, divide by pi, you have these outer products, that's the identity operator. And we can be think and, and when you're thinking about this, just think in terms of a single harmonic oscillator. All right, I think we should um, quit. I'll, I'll show you one more thing. The inner product of two coherent states, it's e to the beta star alpha uh, minus alpha squared over 2 minus beta squared over 2. And that tells you that if beta is equal to alpha, then these things are normalized because this cancels. So um, I think that'll be another homework. This will be another homework problem, and this will be a, another homework problem. So this will be four homework problems, then three coherent state, and one having to do with the transversality of the electromagnetic field. All right, let's. Um, I'm going to race home to try to get there before the debate starts. You're going to what? Are going to post the homework problems on that? Yeah.